the son of Jamunacharya, Vararanga, is the sweetest devotional singer. When he sings bhajans, hymns, and beautiful songs, everyone's hearts melt. Could everyone hear? You may think this is an obstacle, but it's pleasing to the Lord. So why should we think it's an obstacle? How do you roll? <laughs> See, as soon as we appreciated it, it went away. <laughs> that is a great science. <laughs> Ranganath said, send Vararangana to Kanchipur to sing beautiful songs to Varadraj every day. And then Varadraj will give him a benediction. So Mahapurna approached Yamunacharya's son and asked him, please sing for Varadraj and ask for the benediction of sending Ramanujacharya to Shidanga. Vararanga came here, where we are sitting today, to this temple, and he sat before the murti of Varadraj and sang beautiful, beautiful hymns with so much love and devotion. And he remained here for several months. And finally, Varadraj, so pleased, he said, Vararanga, I will give you any benediction. Ask for whatever you like. He said, we are in great need of Ramanujacharya in Sri Rangam. Kindly send him. So Varadraj, through Kanchipurna, gave the order to Ramanujacharya to leave Kanchipurna and go to Sri Rangam. It was very difficult for Ramanujacharya to leave this place, to leave the daily association of Kanchipurna, his life and soul, and to leave the service of Vadadraj. But at the same time, he felt the joy in his heart, because I can do a greater service for my Guru Maharaj there. It is the desire of my God brothers to be there. It was at that time that Ramanujacharya shifted his residence from Kanchipur to Sri Rangam. As soon as he came there, Taruvaranga and the other Vaishnavas installed him as the Acharya of the Sri Sampradaya. In Sri Rangam, Ramanujacharya was thinking about his cousin brother Govinda just to test how attentively you are listening. Do you remember what happened to Govinda? You remember better than me, thank you. He was worshipping Lord Shiva in Kalahasti which is not far from Tirupati, Sri Jaila. Ramanujacharya sent a letter to Sri Shaila Purna, his uncle, and asked him to make Govinda a Vaishnav and send him to Sri Ganga. So Sri Shaila Purna took this very seriously. And he went to the village where Govinda was living. Every day Govinda would go to a lake and on the banks of that lake pick flowers for his worship of Lord Shiva. <coughs> Shailapurna, near that lake, was giving kata to his disciples. 
And every day when Govinda would come, he would hear the kata. And the gentle, devotional qualities of Shaila Purna very deeply affected his heart. So each day, just by listening, every day he stayed longer and longer and longer. One day Shaila Purna asked, what are you doing with those flowers? He said, I'm offering them to Lord Shiva. He said, Lord Shiva? He covers his body with ashes. And what are those ashes? The ashes of, he burns the sins of people, and then the ashes of those sins he puts on his body. He doesn't want flowers. Flowers should be offered to Vishnu. He said, but there's, there's no difference between Shiva and Vishnu. Govinda had replied. So Sri Shailapurna just kept giving Hari Kata every day. And little by little, Govinda was listening, 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 and one day he fell at the lotus feet of Sri Shailapurna and said, I surrender to Vishnu. I want to be your disciple. And I never want to leave you. Shailapurna initiated him. And Govinda lived in Tirupati, at the ashram of Shailapurna, for many years after that. Ramanujacharya was an extraordinary personality. Here he was, the acharya of the whole sampradaya, guru of most qualified, amazing disciples. But yet, he had several gurus himself. And his pride and joy was to study under them, to ask questions from them, and to render menial service to them. In other words, he had not a trace of false ego. In Sri Rangam, one of his greatest joys is he was reunited with Mahapurna. And he would learn the scriptures from Mahapurna, sit at Mahapurna's feet and ask questions. And Ramanujacharya's disciples were very happy to see him in that position. One day, after completing the study of a very holy scripture, Mahapurna gave an instruction to Ramanujacharya. He said, there is a great Vaishnava, like no one else. He is a descendant of the Pandya countryside. If you receive the mantra from him, you will achieve great spiritual benefit. You should go to the village of Tirukothiyor. And that is where you will find the great disciple of Yamunacharya, Gostipurna. And by all means, render humble services to him and beg him, pray to him to initiate you into the sacred mantra. Ramanujacharya took his two prominent disciples, Koresh and Dasarathi. They walked all the way from Sri Rangam to Tirukotiyar. <coughs> he went to the ashram of Gostipurna and said, Mahapurna has instructed me to come to you, to fall at your feet and beg you to initiate me into holy mantra. Gostipurna thought, he was silent for some time. And then he said, go away from now, for now, and I will think about your request. Ramanujacharya felt quite dejected and sad. I'm so unworthy, I'm so unqualified. 
came back again. And Gostipurna again told him, you let me think about it. <coughs> this mantra is very holy, it is very sacred, it cannot be given to just anyone. One day there was a big festival in Sri Rangam, and the Utsav, Vijay Murti, was on a palanquin going through the streets. And Gostipurna came from Tirukotiyar to Sri Rangam for this festival. And at that time, the deity on the palanquin spoke to the pujari and told him to repeat the message. And the message was, Gostipurna, do not be afraid to give this mantra to Ramanujacharya. You should initiate him. And Gostipurna had a little debate with the deity. He said, but this mantra is very sacred. It cannot be touched by the lips of anyone who has even the slightest material desire in their heart. A person has to be very deeply mature in their bhakti to bear the power of this mantra. Ramanujacharya is still very young. I don't think he's ready. And the deity spoke back through the pujari, you do not understand the purity and the greatness of Ramanuja. You give him this mantra. But even then, Gostipurna refused. Sripad Ramanujacharya with his disciples went on that rock for so many hours to Tirukotiyar. Eight times and every time refused by Gostipurna. He didn't exactly say no. He just wouldn't give it. Let me think about it. Finally, Ramanujacharya in his humility, he was not feeling anything negative toward Gostipurna. He was feeling everything negative about himself. He was thinking, I am so sinful. My heart is so wicked. I am so unqualified that even though my guru, Mahapurna, has ordered me to take the mantra, I'm not qualified to receive it. Ramanujacharya was beside himself, weeping and crying in anguish over his unfortunate condition. <coughs> Devotees told Gostipurna, and the next time Ramanuja came, Gostipurna put his arm around him and said, Son, I will give you the mantra. You are fit. The power of this mantra is only known by Lord Vishnu himself. No one else can understand it in full. No person with the slightest desire for material enjoyment in their heart is worthy of receiving this mantra. Because this mantra has the power of liberating the sins of anyone who chants it and sending them back home to Vaikuntha. That is the power of this mantra. And I have seen that in this entire planet Earth, there is no one else fit to receive this mantra except you, Ramanuja. So I will initiate you, but you must make a vow that you will never repeat this mantra to any other being in your life. Gostipurna then initiated Ramanujacharya in the eight-syllable mantra. As soon as he heard it, Ramanujacharya's entire body illuminated with bliss. Hairs were standing on him, tears were flowing from his eyes, his limbs were trembling. He was in transcendental ecstasy of love of God, repeating this mantra over and over and over again. 
Again and again he offered his obeisances falling at the feet of his Guru Maharaj in total gratitude. And then taking leave of Guru Maharaj, he began his trip back to Sri Rangam. As he was walking through the town of Tirukoteyar, he saw so many ordinary materialistic people walking around. And Ramanujacharya's heart began to melt with compassion for them. See how they are toiling for materialistic enjoyment. See how they are bereft of the supreme treasure of pure love of God. See how they are condemned to birth after birth after birth in this material world. It is unbearable to my heart. But I have a mantra that will send them back to Vaikuntha. He became very much inspired and he called out very loudly, everyone, everyone, please come to the temple of Lord Vishnu and I will give you the treasure of the most precious jewels on earth. All kinds of people were very attracted. He's going to give us jewels. <laughs> Soon there were hundreds of people. And then thousands of people gathered. Yamunacharya embraced his two loving disciples, Dasarati and Kuresh. Then he climbed to the top of the temple. And all the people were crying out, please give us the jewels, give us the jewels. And he called with a very loud, tumultuous voice, I have the greatest of all jewels. I will give you the treasure by which you will never take birth in this material world again but you will achieve the eternal service at the lotus feet of Lord Vishnu. Everybody, listen very carefully and very loudly repeat after me. Everyone was transfixed in total anticipation. In absolute silence with eager hearts, they heard Ramanujacharya. And with a voice thundering like lightning, he said, repeat this eight-syllable mantra. Om Namo Narayanaya. Om Namo Narayanaya. But they chanted very loud. <laughs> Namo Narayanaya Om Narayanaya Om Namo Narayanaya Om Narayanaya Everyone was crying. Everyone was looking around and they saw that they were not in the material world, they were in the spiritual world. Envy was erased from their heart, lust was erased from their heart, greed was gone. They were in joy, they were embracing each other with great love. Everyone was in the perfect spirit of servant of the servant of the servant, the Vaikuntha mentality. And they were praising Ramanujacharya and weeping and crying in gratitude, offering obeisances after obeisances after at his lotus feet for giving him the giving them the most precious jewel. Before returning to Sri Rangam, Ramanujacharya with his two disciples decided to once again offer their obeisances to his Guru Maharaj Gostipurna. All the details of what happened had already reached the ears of Gostipurna. He was as angry as a flaming fire. Ramanujacharya came in with his 
with Dasarati and Kuresh. Sri Ramanujacharya fell at the feet of his Gurudev, right in the front of his prime, of his prime disciples. And Gosti Purna just looked at him and screamed with harsh words, Get out of my sight! I never, ever, ever want to see your wicked, dishonest face again. You are the lowest, most sinful person. You promised me never to repeat this mantra to anyone. And then you gave it to thousands of people. You are dishonest. You are a liar. You have broken, you have broken our relationship. Get out from here. I cannot tolerate your face. For the offense you have committed, you will have to spend birth after birth after birth in hell. Get out from here. How would you like your guru to say that to you? In front of your disciples. Ramanujacharya was completely peaceful. With folded palms and tears in his eyes, he spoke. He said, Guru Maharaj, I beg forgiveness from you. He said, but you told me that anyone who hears and chants this mantra will be liberated from material life and attain Vaikuntha. And I saw all these poor, unfortunate, fallen souls suffering in this world. And I could not, I could not restrain myself from giving, this, the, giving them this mantra so that they could all enjoy shelter of the lotus feet of Lord Narayan and Vaikuntha. And if all these thousands of people go back home, back to Godhead and serve Lord Narayan with pure devotion, then what is the loss? If one insignificant, unimportant person like me has to live forever in hell, will not Lord Narayan be more pleased with thousands of people going back to Godhead? Let me go to hell. I will be happy to do so. But then let them have Krishna consciousness. When he said that with all sincerity, Gosti Purna transformed. His anger disappeared like the, like the passing of a violent storm. Suddenly he began to cry. He embraced Ramanujacharya. He said, I have never in my life, I have never met a man who was more compassionate, more loving, and more pure in heart than you. Gostipurna said to Ramanujacharya, Today I accept you as my spiritual master. You are my guru and I am your disciple because you are teaching me what it really means to please the Lord. Such selfless service. Willing to go to hell forever for the upliftment of others. With a sincere and honest heart. I beg forgiveness that I spoke harshly to you. Ramanujacharya fell at the feet of his Guru Maharaj. He said, no Guru Dev, no. He said, whatever power is coming from that mantra to deliver all those people is only because I have received it from your lotus lips. I am your servant, birth after birth after birth. Allow me to always be your eternal menial servant. This was the loving relationship between Gosti Purna and Sri Padramanujacharya. Should I continue? <laughs> One day Kuresh asked Sri Padramanujacharya, can you explain to me the inner meaning of the conclusion of Bhagavad Gita, the most monumental, illustrious verse 
सारव धारमन पुरित्याज्या माम एकम शरणम ब्रजा अहम त्वम सारव पापे ब्यो मोक्षाइ शमिमासुचा Abandon all varieties of religion and just surrender to me. I shall deliver you from all sinful reactions. Do not fear. One who understands properly this verse understands Bhagavad Gita as it is. One time Srila Prabhupada was speaking <coughs> to one very, very famous religious teacher. His name was Yogi Bhajan. He was teaching the Sikh Dharma all over the world and has many, many, many disciples. And there is a tape of this conversation. He approached Prabhupada with great respect and Prabhupada treated him with great respect. But Prabhupada was honest. He said, did not Guru Nanak accept Bhagavad Gita? He said, yes, Guru Nanak accepted Bhagavad Gita. <coughs> and what does Krishna say in Bhagavad Gita? Sarva dharman parityajya mam ekam sharanam praja aham tvam sarva pape vyo moksha ishami masucha. Abandon all varieties of religion and just surrender to me. Me means Krishna. Guru Nanak surrendered to Krishna. So you are teaching all this Astanga Yoga and all this Kriya Yoga and all of these things. Why don't you teach your followers what Guru Nanak taught? To surrender to Krishna. That is Bhagavad Gita. So this verse is very important. On this day, Quraysh asked Ramanujan, please explain to me the inner meaning of this verse. Ramanuja Chaya replied, you cannot understand this verse simply by hearing. You have to qualify your heart by total humility and service to understand this verse. There's no other way. It is not through one's intellectual prowess or one's high position in society. It is by total humility, service attitude that you can understand this verse. Therefore, for one year, you should do madhukari and beg door to door. So please know that Quraysh was like a king. He was a wealthy aristocrat. Quraysh said, my fear is within a year I may die. So please make it less. <laughs> Ramanuja Charya said, all right, for one month, you beg door to door, and you will only eat what people give you as a beggar. Quraysh, as well as his wife, Andala, they took this very seriously. And they put on simple clothes and went out for one month and just begged and accepted whatever little would come. And after that, Ramanuja Charya understood the purity of his heart and explained to him the essence of the verse, Sarvadharman Paratyasya. Seeing this, his disciple Dasarati approached Ramanuja Charya and said, please tell me the inner meaning of Sarva Dharman Purajasya. <coughs> Ramanujacharya said, because you are my nephew, my relative, it's difficult for me to properly chastise you and properly evaluate your strengths and weaknesses because you are my, like my son. He said, better you go to Gostipurna in Tirukotiyor and he will explain the inner meaning of this verse. Dasarathi went to Tirukotiyar and he approached Gostipurna, requested him to explain this verse. Gostipurna said, 
You are a great learned scholar. Such a powerful scholar. When you speak, people are thrilled by every word you say. But you should know that knowledge, learning, wealth, aristocracy, all of these opulences cause pride to form in your heart. If you're proud, then real devotion does not grow. What is the use of knowledge if it creates pride rather than devotion? However, a virtuous person the more he or she learns, the more it awakens good qualities in them. Therefore, you should render menial service. Dasarati remained with Gosti Purna for six months, rendering menial service. And finally, Gosti Purna told him, I am satisfied with your menial service. Now you go back to Ramanujacharya and ask him to explain the inner meaning of this verse from Bhagavad Gita. Dasarati returned to Kanchipuram and he explained everything to his Guru Maharaj, Ramanujam. He has sent me and told me that you will explain this verse to me. At that time, the daughter of Mahapurna, whose name was Atulai, she came in Ramanuja's presence in a very distressed condition. She poured out her heart before Ramanuja. She said, my father, Mahapurna, he doesn't know how to deal with this crisis situation in life. He has told me to approach you. Maybe you can help me. He said, she said, I am married and my in-laws are mistreating me and harassing me and it's become unbearable. She said, they make me go over a mile away to collect water in buckets back and forth. And because of my weak and frail body, it's so painful. By the time I come back with that water, I'm totally exhausted. And then they expect me to do all the cooking and all the cleaning and all the housework. And because I cannot do it according to their expectations, they chastise me. They said, why have your father not sent a cook? Why had he sent such a useless soul as you? You cannot even do the basic duties of your work? She said, this is what I have to undergo every day. Ramanujacharya looked at Dasarati who was there to find out about Sarvadharma and Purikyasha. <laughs> and he said to Atulai, you see this Brahmin here? Take him with you. He will carry the water all the day, he will do the cleaning and he will do all the cooking in the house. The greatest scholar, Dasarati, accepted his guru's words as his life and soul. He went to the village and became the cook for this family. And he would go every day back and forth with buckets of water to carry it for the cooking and the washing. And he would clean up menial services. And whenever, whenever the family was dissatisfied with him, they would chastise him. And he would just very humbly accept the chastisement of these very, very ordinary materialistic people and just tolerate it and try to correct himself according to their expectations and serve. Why? Because that was the order of his Guru Maharaj. <coughs> this went on for about a year.
He was cooking. He was carrying water. He was cleaning. One day, when he was carrying the water, a Vaishnav came to the town and in a public place was speaking from the scriptures. But what he was saying was tainted with Mayavad philosophy. And although Dasarathi was totally in disguise as a menial humble servant of the family, he could not tolerate this. And after the Vaishnav spoke, he said that actually what you are saying is not correct, it's like this. Oh, and that Vaishnav, he became outraged. He said, what is this? Who is this? Go back to your kitchen and clean your pots, you menial cook. What right do you have to speak philosophy to me? I am an orator of the science of Siddhanta. And Dasarati very mildly, humbly explained how what he was saying is wrong. He quoted such scripture with such logic, with such compassion, with such a perfect presentation that everyone was spellbound. The Vaishnav orator fell at his feet and begged forgiveness. And everyone around fell at his feet and begged forgiveness. And said, you are the greatest scholar that we have ever heard. Your heart is full of such pure compassion. You're a saint. What are you doing carrying water and cooking for this materialistic family? And he said, I am simply carrying out the order of my Guru Maharaj because the order of the spiritual master is one's life and soul. And then they all figured out this is the famous scholar Dasarati who everyone knows, who everyone respects. But he was hiding himself. When that was revealed they asked him, what are you doing here? You are the great Dasarati. What are you doing? He said, it is the order of Gurudev. So the mother and father of Atulai, as well as all the leaders of the town, they all went to Srirangam and fell at the feet of Ramanujacharya and begged him, please, this Dasarati, he shouldn't be doing this kind of work, just cleaning pots and cooking for <laughs> mundane people. Please bring him back to Sri Rangam. He's such a great person. Ramanujacharya was so pleased with Dasarati's humble service that along with the people, Ramanujacharya went to that village. Dasarathi fell at his feet. Ramanujacharya picked him up and embraced him and said, I am most pleased by your devotional service. Now I will reveal to you the innermost secret of Sarvadharman Puritya Mam he kam sharanam praja Aham tham sarvapa pedyo And Dasarathi was very happy. <clears throat> One great disciple of Yamunacharya named Maladhara he was a dear friend of Mahapurna. Mahapurna told Ramanujacharya that he has mastered particular scriptures you should learn from him. So Ramanuja went and very humbly listened. But once Ramanuja gave an explanation which was not exactly the same as Maladhara. And Maladhara left. He said, what kind of student gives a different interpretation than the teacher? This is not proper. <coughs> so it was actually Gostipurna. Gostipurna asked Maladhara, how, how was your teachings to Ramanuja? He told him what happened. He said, please don't consider him an ordinary person. I know him very well. He 
he knows the heart of Yamunacharya so intimately and dearly. Whatever, even though I am Yamunacharya's disciple, and even though I have given the mantra to Ramanujacharya, when he speaks, I always hear the essence of the voice of Yamunacharya speaking through him. So Maladhara returned to give lessons to Ramanujacharya. And another time, Ramanujacharya gave an explanation which was slightly different. But this time, Maladhara listened very carefully and with tears of love in his eyes, directly heard Yamunacharya speaking through him. Ramanujacharya was becoming very famous. His fame was spreading throughout the entire land. Practically all of southern India was speaking of nothing but Ramanujacharya. Thousands of people of all classes were coming from all directions to take shelter of him, to learn from him. One of the high priests of the Ranganath temple, who was making a lot of money and who was very popular, became envious of Ramanujacharya because his fame and popularity was exceeding his own. He decided Ramanuja must die. He invited Ramanuja Charya to his home for prasad. And he told his wife that there is a deadly poison, enough to kill ten men. I don't have to tell you what to do. You know what to do. So it is an obedient wife who had the same mentality as her husband, very envious. She put poison in the food. And according to the invitation, Ramanujacharya arrived at the house. But when he arrived, the wife saw him. He was so gentle, so humble, so respectful, so full of love and compassion, that just by seeing him, her heart melted. She served the food to Ramanujacharya, and she said, please, do not eat this. <laughs> she put it down and said, it is my husband's order to serve you this food. I cannot disobey his order, but please, I beg you, do not eat this. Because if you do, you will die. Hamanujachaya was stunned. He left the place. And on the banks of the Kaveri, he met with Gosti Purna and told him what happened. And he said, what is it about me? This is Ramanujacharya's heart. What is it about me that is so bad that people are envious and want to kill me? What is this impurity? What is this bad quality in me that he wants to kill me? And I feel such great sympathy for him that his heart is burning with this great fire of envy. How can this high priest be delivered? Gosti Burna said, because you are praying to Ranganath for him, he will be delivered. The priest came home and asked his wife, ah, did he eat the food? She said, no, I told him. <laughs> the priest couldn't chastise his wife because he knew that as a woman she had a very soft heart. He cannot blame her. So he made another plan. The next evening, he put enough poison to kill ten grown men in Charanamrit and gave that to Ramanujacharya. 
Ramanujacharya in his heart knew that the Charanamrit was poisoned. But he felt because it's Charanamrit, it's the foot wash of the Lord. Even though there's poison in it, I cannot refuse it. It would be an offense to the Lord. This was his love for Charanamrit. So he drank it. And he prayed to Ranganath to protect him. And as he was thinking, meditating on Ranganath in this way, he went into ecstasy and his limbs were trembling. And the high priest was thinking, ah, limbs trembling, the poison is working. <laughs> Tomorrow morning I will see the flames and the smoke of his funeral pyre. <laughs> The next day morning, the high priest was coming to the temple and he heard hundreds and hundreds of people chanting Ramanujacharya's glories. And then he saw right in the middle, where everyone was in a circle around him, Ramanujacharya was sitting in meditation, effulgent with illustrious spiritual beauty. At that point, the high priest realized the greatness of Ramanujacharya and fell at Ramanujacharya's feet, begging forgiveness. He felt so guilty that he tried to kill such a great saint that he was beating his head against the rocks in the ground until his entire head was bleeding and blood was flowing all over on the ground. And then he started ripping his chest with his he was beating his chest so hard and ripping it with his nails that his whole body was covered with blood. I have tried to kill a saint. Please curse me, kill me, and let me go to hell for my sins. Ramanujacharya came out of his samadhi and saw him in that way and put his hand on his head and said, you are forgiven. Sri Ranganath has forgiven you. Seeing the compassion of this great soul, the high priest surrendered to Ramanujacharya and became his disciple. Should I continue? <laughs> There was a great scholar named Yadya Murti. He was a Digvijay Pandit. The Mayavadi. He came to Sri Rangam especially to challenge Ramanujacharya. Ramanujacharya said, I have no business in debates and arguments. Before we even begin, I declare that you are the winner, I am the loser, I will sign any documents you have. But why should we debate? Yeah? Then you accept that the form of God is an illusion, his pastimes are an illusion, his abode is an illusion, that bhakti is ultimately an illusion, that the only one supreme truth is the formless Brahman that has no qualities and everything else is Maya? You accept that? Ramanujacharya had to enter into the debate. But this man was a great debater. They argued for 17 days and neither one could defeat the other. At the end of 17 days, Ramanujacharya was feeling very despondent. And he went to Ranganath Mandir and stood before the deity. I'm sorry. He went to the deity of his own ashram. The name of that deity was Devaraj, just outside the Ranganath temple. And he prayed to Devaraj <coughs> that this Mayavadi philosophy is like a dark cloud that's covering the real knowledge of the scriptures. 
so many people are being bewildered by this Mayavad philosophy and being cheated of your eternal loving service. But in this age of Kali, it is so powerful, it is so powerful that I am not able to defeat this person. Please save the world of this Mayavad philosophy. And Devaraj then spoke to Ramanujacharya. He said, Ramanuja, you will be victorious. You will dissipate the cloud of illusion of Mayabad and establish pure devotional service within this world. Then Ramanujacharya became ecstatic. The next day when they came for the debate, Ramanuja came to the ashram of Yajyamurti and he was effulgent and blissful. And Yagyamurti was thinking, why are you so blissful? Last night we were despondent. What is this? You're so tolerant, you're so compassionate, you're so blissful. I surrender to you. <laughs> and Yagyamurti said, no more argument, no door to me. I become a Vaishnava. I become your disciple. I surrender. <laughs> Ramanujacharya understood that he didn't do anything. It was the Lord within his heart that transformed him. And he initiated him and gave him the name Devaraj Muni, named after the Murti that delivered him. Sometime later, four young men who were very serious about spiritual life came to Ramanujacharya begging for initiation. Please listen carefully. Are you still awake? Because in the darkness, I cannot see your eyes. I don't know if you're sleeping or awake. I don't even know if you're there. You are just like one homogeneous transcendental sangam of devotees where I cannot understand who is who. It's very blissful actually. So these four men came to Ramanuja and said, please, we want to take initiation from you. And Ramanuja said that you should go to Devaraj Muni. He is a learned scholar and he is a pure devotee of Lord Narayan. Accept him as your guru and take initiation. So the four men went to Devaraj Muni. Devaraj Muni became very perturbed. He came back to his Guru Maharaj, Ramanuja. He said, why are you doing this to me? He said, my whole life I have been embroiled in the fire of false ego. Now that I've become a devotee, it is, it is the battle of my life to somehow subdue my false pride. I'm fighting against vanity like anything. I know that I cannot attain love for Krishna as long as there's a trace of vanity or pride in my heart. But my whole life I have been cultivating it, developing it, and nourishing it. And now I'm trying to deal with it. I'm trying to be the most humble, menial servant of the servant of your servants, and now you're sending people to me to be my disciples, where they're going to obey me, they're going to surrender to me, they're going to offer prayers to me, they're going to glorify me. This is like poison for me. I'm not worthy. I'm still too much puffed up. Please save me. Are you trying to test me, or are you serious? Ramanujacharya said to Devaraj Muni, I was testing you to see if you still had the desire for prestige and recognition. But you have passed the test. Now you remain living with me for the rest of your life as the servant of the servant of the servant. And Devaraj Muni was very grateful and happy. 
श्री रामनुज चाय की वन डे श्रीपाद रामनुज चाय वाज रीडिंग द प्रेयर्स ऑफ नाम अलवार describing the glories of tirupati which is by kunta on earth and how lord venkateshwar finds great pleasure being decorated with flowers he asked his disciples is there anyone amongst you who is willing to leave shri rangam and live the rest of your life in tirupati cultivating a garden to offer flowers to balaji there was dead silence who wants to leave shri rangam or guru maharaj is living and speaking every day who wants to leave the nice temperate climate to live on top of a mountain where it's very cold in the winter and in those days it was a thick dense forest with wild animals everywhere dead silence then one very simple and humble devotee named ananta charya raised his hand and said guru maharaj if it is your wish that i go to tirupati with your blessings i will go and stay for the rest of my life Ramanuja Charya was so happy. He got up and embraced Ananta Charya and said, "You are my life and soul. There is no one more dear to me than you, because you are willing to make such sacrifice to assist me in the service of the Lord. You are the greatest amongst men." And immediately, Ananta Charya with his wife. made the residence on the top of the hill of Tirumala to worship the Venkateshwar with flowers last night we spoke that story or was it the night before Ramanuja Charya wanted to visit anandeshwar i mean ananta charya and he also wanted to go on pilgrimage to tirupati so he told his followers that he will go on a pilgrimage to visit sri venkateshwar in tirupati on the way they stopped in several places one place was asta sahasra ramanuja charya had two disciples there yagnesh and varada charya yagnesh was a very wealthy merchant shri ramanuja charya in the outskirts of town sent two of his disciples to yagyesh's house to inform him that ramanuja charya and his entourage would like to come and spend the night at your home oh yagyesh was so so happy and grateful immediately he was calling his servants prepare this prasad prepare this bhoga fix this bed fix this pando make these decorations make garlands he was just going all over the house telling everyone to do so much he was so excited guru maharaj is coming guru maharaj is coming shri ramanuja chai is coming to stay at our house let us make it a glorious reception He was running in all directions and getting every servant and every family member just busy, busy, busy to receive Ramanuja Chai. But in the excitement, he did not even offer a sitting place or a glass of water 
to the two disciples who came with the news. So they returned to Ramanujacharya. They said that Yajesh is making grand arrangements for your reception. Ramanuja was not concerned with that. He asked, how did he treat you? But he was so busy making arrangements for you, he completely ignored us. He didn't even give us a place to sit. Didn't even give us water. Ramanujacharya was disgusted with Yajnesh. He said, we will not go to his house. If he is not properly serving my servants, there is no possibility of him pleasing me with any arrangements. Then they went to the house of Varadacharya. Now Varadacharya was a very poor man. He had nothing. In fact, he used to just go out to beg to get food for him and his wife. His wife's name was Lakshmi. So when Ramanujacharya came to the house, Varadacharya was out begging door to door. And only Lakshmi was home. And she was shocked. Here's our Guru Maharaj, Ramanujacharya, with all his topmost disciples had come to my house. And she sat them down. And she was, let me cook them a feast. But then she looked in the kitchen. There was not a single grain of rice. What to do? So she told Ramanujacharya and all his disciples that please go to the Pukur and take your bath. And while you're taking bath, I will prepare your prasad. While they were taking bath, she was wondering what to do. My, my guru and my husband's guru is at my home. I must serve him properly, but I have nothing to offer. But then she remembered. There was a very wealthy man who was young and handsome, who had terrible lust for Lakshmi. Again and again, he offered Lakshmi all sorts of wealth if she would be enjoyed by him. But being a chaste and faithful wife, even though her husband had nothing, she always totally rejected him and ignored him. Again and again and again he tried to seduce her. But she never reciprocated. So he was beginning to give up hope. But Lakshmi Devi ran out the back door. And she went to that wealthy man's house and went right into his inner quarters. And she told him that tonight I will be enjoyed by you. But you just do this one thing for me. My Guru Maharaj has come to my house and I have nothing to offer him. Please send all the boga and facilities for me to cook a wonderful feast for him and then I will do anything you want tonight. He was jubilant. It was the fulfillment of years of his longing to enjoy this beautiful woman. He sent most delectable grains and vegetables and fruits and spices And she prepared an incredible feast and served it to Ramanuja and all of the disciples that came with him. And in the middle of it all, Vardraj comes home with a little bag of chipped rice that he went out begging to get. <laughs> and he sees, he sees his Guru Maharaj in his house. Ramanuja Chaya Guru Dave, you were in my house. And he saw 
Quraysh and Dasarati and all these disciples, and he saw they were all eating a succulent feast of so many opulent preparations, and his wife was serving it. He was bewildered. He said, how is this possible? He approached his wife and said, what's happening? How is he coming? And where did you get this prasad? And Lakshmi put her head down in great shame. And she explained, you know that notorious, low-class, lusty man? I told him that I would spend the night with him because I was thinking that service to the Guru is above, is above anything else. Even if I have to go to hell, I must serve my Guru Maharaj properly. Bharadacharya became ecstatic. He said, I am so fortunate to have a wife like you who has so much faith and devotion to our spiritual master. I am proud of you. And I fully, fully respect and adore the decision that you made to serve our Guru Maharaj. Then Varadacharya and Lakshmi both told Ramanujacharya about what had transpired. You still awake? <laughs> Ramanujacharya took the remnants of his Maha Maha Prasad. And he fed Lakshmi and Bharadacharya. And he also took the remnants of their Maha 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 Prasad. They were the remnants of Ramanujacharya. He said, you both go this evening to this rich merchant and give him this prasad. So the two of them went. Vardacharya waited outside the door and Lakshmi went inside to the inner quarters. And she gave him Ramanujacharya's Maha Prasad. He ate that prasad. Just by eating that prasad, his heart changed. He no longer looked at Lakshmi with lust, but he looked at Lakshmi as the most respectable mother. Amazing. He said, I have no... I am ashamed. I am ashamed of how I have treated you. Now... I adore you like a mother. I have no desire to enjoy you. I'll give you whatever you want to serve your Guru Maharaj unconditionally. They said, Ramanujacharya wants us to bring you back to meet him. That person was transformed by the power of Mahaprasad and by the power of Lakshmi's unavoid devotion. That merchant came and fell at the feet of Ramanujacharya and begged forgiveness for his sins and surrendered his life at the lotus feet. Meanwhile, there was a wonderful festival going on. All the devotees were so happy and Yajnesh was still waiting for Ramanujacharya and his, and his entourage to come, but they never came. <laughs> then he heard that they were at Bharadacharya's house. So Yajnesh came to Bharadacharya's house and he fell at the feet of Ramanujacharya. He didn't know what happened. He said, your servant said you were coming. I made every type of preparation. We made big feasts, we made decorations, garlands, everything, but you never came. Why didn't you come, Guru Maharaj? And Ramanujacharya said very sternly, because you mistreated my servants. Now please understand that these two devotees that went were not high-ranking personalities in his entourage. 
They were just simple devotees. But because he did not properly respect, honor, and serve the most simple messengers, Ramanujacharya could not accept his service. This is the Vaishnav Siddhanta. Servant of the servant of the servant. You cannot please Krishna by approaching him directly unless you please his devotees. And you cannot please the spiritual master by approaching him directly unless you're humbly eager to serve the devotees. That is the principle of the spiritual world. Yagyesh repented and begged forgiveness, fell at his feet. Give me another chance, Gurudev. <coughs> Ramanujacharya said, on the way back from Tirupati, we will stop at your house. He stopped in Kanchipuram where we are sitting for three days and there enjoyed the nectar of Kanchipurna's association and then went to Tirupati. <coughs> we told the story how Ramanujacharya remained at the bottom of the hill. And when Anantacharya came down and saw him lecturing there, he asked, why don't you come up to see Balaji? He said, Tirupati, this hill is the body of Anantashesha. It is like Kunta. How can I touch it with my feet? I will contaminate it. But Anantacharya and the, and, the, and the priests who came down, they said, if you do not come up, then what is our qualification to be up there? Then no one will ever go up there to do seva for Balaji ever again. You must show the standard by coming up and performing the service. So although he was so humble, for the sake of encouraging the Vaishnavas, <coughs> he went to the top of Tirupati. And when Ramanujacharya saw the beautiful form of Balaji, he fainted, unconscious, in transcendental ecstasy of love of God. And he remained for one year on the bottom of the hill, studying, Sri Ramayan from Shaila Purna. During that time at Shaila Purna's ashram, Govinda, his cousin, brother, was still living with him. And he was seeing that Govinda was doing very mysterious things. Would you like to know some of those things? <laughs> Govinda was the humble servant of Shaila Purna. At night, he was, Ramanujacharya would see, he would make Shailapurna's bed, and then he would lay on the bed. And then he would get up and offer to his Gurudev. <laughs> so Ramanujacharya told Shailapurna, this is not etiquette. So Shailapurna said to Govinda, this is not proper. Do you not know that to lay on your guru's bed or to wear his shoes is a great offense? Why are you doing this? And Govinda explained, because I want to make sure your bed is perfectly comfortable. I want to make sure there is no prickers or anything that will harm your body. So first I test it, and when I see that it's a perfectly proper place to sleep, then only do I offer it to you. And if I have to go to hell for making this offense, I don't mind. I don't mind going to hell forever as long as you're comfortable sleeping on your bed, Guru Maharaj. What does this story reveal? Krishna accepts the purpose in which everything is offered. Although, from a ritualistic, legalistic point of view, he was making an offense. But his intention was so pure. 
His intention was unconditional loving service. And ultimately, Krishna and Guru accepts that intention. Another day, Ramanujacharya saw something very strange. In the courtyard of Sri Shailapurna's home in Tirupati, Govinda had his left hand around a venomous cobra snake, and he had his right finger stuck in the mouth of the snake and down the snake's throat. And the snake was just writhing in pain. <laughs> and Govinda just had his finger just stuck right in his throat and the snake was just... <laughs> because I'm a snake, I know how to do like this. <laughs> so Ramanujachari asked Govinda, what are you doing? <laughs> of all, this is a deadly snake. If he bites you, you'll die. Why do you have your finger in his mouth? And second of all, why are you torturing this poor snake by sticking your finger down its throat? This is not proper etiquette. <laughs> and Govinda replied, that here, Ramanujacharya Dev, he said, I was watching this snake and while he was eating, he swallowed a thorn. And because of that thorn, that thorn was stuck in his throat and it was killing him. So out of compassion, not able to tolerate the pain of the snake, I stuck my finger in his mouth to get the thorn out. <coughs> but now the thorn's out, so he's writhing in pain, but after some time he'll be very healthy and happy again. And sure enough, after a few minutes, the snake was smiling. <laughs> Another time, Govinda, he would go out to collect water to bring back to his guru. But one day, he didn't return in time. He was sitting outside of the house of a prostitute on her steps. And Ramanujacharya said, Govinda, what are you doing? <laughs> Sitting in the steps outside the house of a prostitute. And Govinda said, someone there inside are singing the glories of the Lord, and I just can't stop listening to them. Ramanujacharya loved his cousin brother, Govinda. And he prayed to Ranganath to send Govinda, I mean, he prayed to Balaji, Tirupati, to send Govinda back to Sri Rangam. And he begged Sri Shailapurna. Sri Shailapurna was so happy with Ramanujacharya, he said, I'll do anything for you. You have served so nicely, I will do anything you want. What would you like? And Ramanujacharya said, please, let your disciple Govinda come back with me to Sri Rangam. He said, yes, let him go. So Govinda came, and they came down to Kanchipuram first. And Kanchipurna was asked by Ramanujacharya to pray to Varadraj to give Govinda pure unalloyed love for his spiritual master and Krishna. And Kanchipurna said, I will, I will make this prayer. However, I see in Govinda's face that he's very unhappy. Although he's obedient to his guru's order and he loves you more than anything, he's given his life and soul to Sri Shaidapurna. He saved his life. He's feeling very, very despondent to be in separation from him. Please send him back to his guru and make him happy. So Ramanujacharya said to Govinda, go back to Tirupati and live with Sri Shaivapurna. And Govinda was blissful. 
to go back to be with Gurudev. So he went all the way back to Tirupati, such a long distance. He walked all the way, he climbed the mountain, he went to the ashram of Shishai Lapurna. He hadn't eaten for days. And when he arrived, Shishai Lapurna completely neglected him. Didn't even call him for prasad. Shishai Lapurna's wife was feeling, what's happening? Why is he treating him so cruelly? So right in front of Govinda, the wife asked Shishai Lapurna, why don't you at least invite Govinda to eat prasad? He's hungry. He hasn't eaten for days. Shishai Lapurna would not look at Govinda. He said to his wife, in a way that Govinda could hear, he said, you do not feed a horse that you've already sold to someone else. Hare Krishna. Govinda was in ecstasy. He understood that it was genuinely Sri Shailapurna's desire that he be the servant of Ramanujacharya in Sri Rangam. So at that time, he blissfully went back to Sri Rangam and spent the rest of his life in the service of Ramanujacharya. Meanwhile, <coughs> Govinda's mother came to Sri Rangam and told Ramanujacharya that many years ago Govinda was married and he's been up with his guru for all these years. He doesn't even know what his wife looks like. <laughs> but now, you know, she's old. She wants to have a baby. So please send him home so that they can have babies together. So Ramanujacharya told Govinda, you must go home and you must spend night with your wife. So Govinda went home. Ramanujacharya gave him this instruction. Household life means you perform your bhajan and you perform your seva and become purified. And then in that purified state, you serve your family and have children. That is grihasta life. So Govinda went home. But then he returned to Ramanujacharya and said, I went home and I spent the night with my wife, but all I could do is tell her about Lord Narayan. <laughs> He said, I was thinking like this, that I'm doing my bhajan and my heart becomes purified. If my heart becomes purified, I don't want a wife or children. I just want exclusive 100% dedication to Guru and Lord Narayan without any distraction. So Ramanujacharya said to Govinda, that everyone should choose the ashram according to their temperament. Your temperament is that of a sannyasi. You should take sannyas. So Ramanujacharya called Govinda's mother, Dipdimati, got the blessings of her, got the blessings of the wife, got the blessings of everyone, and on that same day, Ramanujacharya awarded Govinda initiation as sannyasi. No. Should I continue? No. Now we have two choices. We have to leave this place at 8 o'clock, which is less than one hour. We could have kirtan now, and devotees can also go for darshans. And then we could continue our narration tomorrow at the Shiva Kanshi temple. Or we can just carry on now for the next hour. We will have vote. The first vote is Harinam Kirtan and whoever wants to disappear and go for the darshans of Bharadraj may go. And the second option is 
for many of you to get a good night's sleep <laughs> by sitting through my lecture. <laughs> uh, but if we choose number one, we can speak tomorrow also. So you can loudly chant Haribo according to your preference. How many people vote for number one? Yeah!